I'm Bradley Barron, I'm the Director of Career Services, and I'm going to let Jamie talk about um, HUD and the Legal Honors Program, and you're going to talk about the Student Internship Program, too. Mm -hmm. My name is Jamie Cartman. I am an Attorney Advisor at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in the Office of General Counsel in Jacksonville. Uh, I graduated from Florida Coastal in 2009 and came into the Legal Honors Program that year, so uh, I just celebrated my seventh year at HUD. Um, um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about externships, um, which since y'all are so far away here in Orlando, uh, is really for one of and two L's. Um, we do offer summer externships in Jacksonville, um, we try and hold them open for students outside of the Jacksonville area, um, and they are for, pro, uh, for credit or pro bono. Um, but really I'm here to talk about the Legal Honors Program, which is our primary hiring vehicle. So, um, as 3L, this is the time to apply. Applications are due September 9th, which is a deadline that comes up very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of students miss it. So, by being here and getting educated, um, you hopefully won't miss the deadlines. Um, the Legal Honors Program is a postgraduate entry level position. It is a 14 month program and uh, subject to appropriations, bar passage, and your performance. Uh, you will be converted to an attorney position at the end of that 14-month program, so um, it can be a career um, as opposed to a 14-month program. Uh, most federal agencies have a legal honors program, so if you are not familiar with them but you're interested in federal service, um, I would definitely get educated not just on HUD but all of the legal honors programs. I would consider applying to all of the legal honors programs. Um, the federal system, once you get into it, it's a lot easier to move around within it. And um, a lot of the agencies do the same thing because essentially the government is a big business. Of course, there are regulatory and government things that overlay all of that, but um, if you're interested in doing, say, personnel law, I mean, every agency is going to have that. Um, the career services folks can give you the information if you don't already have it. The University of Arizona puts out a federal legal honors handbook, and that has all of the agencies links to the information so that you can uh, explore that. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about HUD, of course, but um, I just like to let students know that it's not just HUD, that there's I mean, everything from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to HUD to EPA to IRS, they all have programs. Um, so HUD is a cabinet level agency. We're headed by secretary. Our secretary is 13th in line for the presidency, although right now he is 12th in line because one of the secretaries before him is not a natural born U.S. citizen. Uh, so they're not, uh, she is not eligible. I think it's the secretary of the interior. So that can be your fun fact for the day. Um, and also, uh, so you know how when they do the State of the Union, they have a designated survivor where they pull someone out? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? So if someone blows up the State of the Union, they're subject sure. to maintain the con to continuity of government. So there, there's a new show with Kiefer Sutherland as the designated survivor, and he is the Secretary of HUD, and I'm so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that that's cool. Um, our current secretary is Julian Castro. He is a former practicing attorney. Uh, he was the mayor of San Antonio before he was tapped for this position. Uh, our agency has about 7,600 employees in 66 offices in D.C., uh, all 50 states, Puerto Rico. And um, our mission is to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality affordable homes for all. Uh, Secretary Castro calls HUD the Department of Opportunity because of the unique impact that we're able to make on the access to housing, strengthening communities, and encouraging economic development. Uh, the Office of General Counsel, we provide legal counsel to the secretary and his authorized agents. So um, our client relationship is to the folks that work at HUD. So um, we're essentially like in-house counsel for the federal government. Um, so if someone has a Section 8 voucher from a public housing authority and they need legal assistance, they would put legal aid on us. We're not dealing with the folks that um, are the recipients of our programs, we're dealing with the folks who administer those programs, and then they have their clients, but um, we don't work with the folks on the outside. We represent the agency itself, and my client is the federal government. 
Um, and so our mission is to provide legal services based on the highest professional and ethical standards that support and facilitate the achievement of HUD's mission. Uh, nationwide, OGC has 375 attorneys, so we are a big law firm. Uh, we've got attorneys in Washington, D.C., 10 regional offices, and 28 field offices. Uh, here in Florida, there are two field offices. There's one in Jacksonville and one in Miami. Both have attorneys. And our regional office is in Atlanta, which also has attorneys. Um, there's a bit of a hierarchy to the way that um, the agency is organized and the kind of work that attorneys do in different uh, offices. Uh, if you're in headquarters, it's a very specialized practice. Um, in headquarters, each of the programs has their own staff that develops policy, and then they have attorneys that work specifically with them on those programs. So there's an Office of Assisted Housing and Community Development, and those attorneys work exclusively on those types of programs. Uh, finance and administrative law, the attorneys in that office will work on Freedom of Information Act requests, or they'll work with Ginny May on mortgage-backed securities. Uh, we have ethics and personnel folks who um, the ethics attorneys will review the secretary's financial disclosures. Uh, insured housing, uh, we have legislation and regulation. They work with folks on the Hill. Insured housing works on our insured housing programs. Of course, we have litigation for when we get sued. So we have attorneys that do defensive litigation for HUD. Uh, we have fair housing, and those folks um, will prosecute violators of the Fair Housing Act. We have administrative law judges. So the attorneys um, doing fair housing litigation will go in front of the administrative law judges and handle cases. Um, although if they elect to federal court, our attorney in federal court is the Department of Justice. So the HUD litigation attorney would sit second chair in that case because the Department of Justice would be our counsel. Um, and then HUD counsel acts as the, um, essentially the expert on HUD programs to advise the Department of Justice how to represent us. Um, but you would help with drafting and things like that. Um, and then we have program enforcement. So we also have attorneys in our Departmental Enforcement Center who go after violators of HUD programs with civil money, civil money penalties and um, other forms of sanctions. Um, and then within our regional offices, it's a little bit more specialized. Or I'm sorry, a little less specialized. Um, because in headquarters, everybody is very specialized to what they do. Uh, in the regional offices, we have either program attorneys or litigation attorneys. Uh, the litigation attorneys handle both fair housing and personnel matters, as well as other litigation things like a single-family bankruptcy lien stripping matter. Um, so it's, it's a broader variety of litigation. Um, and then the program attorneys will advise the uh, program staff on various matters. They'll do real estate closings. Um, and so uh, it becomes a little bit broader because you have more clients in your office and you're working with all of them. Um, thank you so much. And then the field attorneys are the most generalized. Um, so like the office I'm in, um, we represent all of the clients in our office. We have multifamily housing, single family housing, and office of healthcare programs. Uh, we have our front office folks who handle Freedom of Information Act requests. We have public housing, community planning and development. Uh, we have fair housing staff in our office. So whatever issues or questions they uh, have come to us, um, if they need clearances for certain things, they will come to us. So it's a much broader practice. And um, that also changes with the number of attorneys. So field office uh, usually has one to four attorneys. Uh, in our Jacksonville office, we have two, my boss and myself. Our Miami office has four attorneys. A regional office usually has 10 to 20. And then the um, offices at headquarters, usually 10 to 20, I think, depending on uh, what kind of work we do. Um, so the Legal Honors Program. Um, before I talk about the Legal Honors Program, do you have any questions about what HUD does? So, like I said, the Legal Honors Program is the only recruiting program for entry-level attorneys. So if you want to come to HUD and be an attorney, um, you're not going to find that job posting on USA Jobs. 
the legal honors program is the way that we bring in folks. Um, most federal agencies only bring in people through legal honors programs. Uh, occasionally you'll see a lateral position um, or a entry level position posted on USA Jobs, but those are few and far between. Um, the legal honors program is really the way to get into the federal government as an attorney, um, unless you happen to have really good luck navigating the federal hiring process, which uh, <laughs> is complex um, and very regimented. Um, so the legal honors program is for three L's and for graduate law students or law clerks who have not been admitted to any bar. Um, so generally the folks that apply are third year students because most people are not going to put off taking a bar uh, to apply for this program. Um, so you would apply now, since it's the beginning of your 3L year, and it's for anyone that gets a JD before uh, June 30th of 2017. So if you graduate in December, this would still be the program you apply for. Um, like I said, it's a 14-month appointment that could become a permanent position pending appropriations, bar admission, and performance. Uh, generally, the appropriations are there if they're doing the program, but um, it's not a guarantee until the money is there because we all know Congress is a little... Um, so... The uh, program itself, you are hired into a specific office um, and you are doing attorney work from day one. Um, it's very much like any other government job where you're expected to kind of hit the ground running and you do have support, you do have uh, resources, but you are also, um, you're expected to do the work. Um, my first day, my boss gave me a file and I looked down and I said, this is a $48 million deal, what do I do with this? And he said, you go in your office and you work on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, there, there's there's a little bit more training than that, but um, it's it's, uh, it's definitely an opportunity to do substantive work from day one. Uh, during your 14 months, you will get an opportunity to do one, maybe two, four week rotations. And the rotation allows you um, to rotate to another legal office um, if you're in headquarters, you could rotate from Office of Insurance Housing to um, Administrative Law, or you could rotate from a DC position to somewhere out in the field. Um, we've had a few folks who have had family reasons that they're not able to physically travel somewhere else for a month, so they rotate um, maybe to a program office to do their rotation to get some different experience. Um, it, it kind of depends on your circumstances and what you're interested in doing, but it's a very flexible opportunity to um, go and see another part of the agency. Uh, the idea of the rotation is um, that you're getting four weeks, which is supposed to allow you to do something substantive, as opposed to, you know, a week is not a very long time, but in four weeks, hopefully you can see something through, you can finish a memo, you could close a deal, um, you would have an opportunity to, to really understand whatever it is that you're working on to get to really know the folks in the office that you're working in um, and to expose yourself to other parts of the agency and develop those connections. Um, and so it's really a great opportunity. When I did my legal honors rotation, I went to DC for a month and um, I worked in the general counsel's office under one of her special assistants because I wanted to see what the political folks do because I'm civil service. So um, that was a really interesting opportunity and I got to see some things that I wouldn't otherwise see in the field that I wouldn't otherwise see as someone on the civil service side of things. So it was um, a really interesting opportunity and everyone does different things. Um, one of my friends in my legal honors class was in DC. He went to Colorado for his rotation so he could go skiing on the weekends. Um, you know, everyone has a different motivation for where they rotate and why. Uh, you're also assigned a mentor, which is a really nice thing. Um, it, it is a formal program. Uh, there's someone that they point to that this is your mentor. It is not your supervisor. It is an experienced attorney either in your office or another office that you can call and say, hey, I have a question about this. How do I handle this issue with my supervisor? Um, how do I allocate the money in my TSP account, which is our version of a 401k? Um, you know, what kind of insurance should I sign up for? So. Um, they can help you navigate the federal system as well as your legal job. So it's nice to have that resource as well. Um, they also do, about halfway through the year, 
um, a video conference where they bring the mentors in and everybody gets to introduce their mentor and talk about their relationship. Um, my mentee this year is in the Atlanta office um, and he's a litigator so he's been down here a few times and had a chance to have dinner um, and catch up in person. Um, other folks that are in the same office, there's a pair that uh, took up a um, roller derby. They, they joined a roller <laughs> derby team together this year. Um, so it's an opportunity to really develop a relationship with somebody um, outside of your supervisory chain. Um, and of course you also have your legal honors class to um, develop relationships with and create your network across the country. Um, generally there are 10 to 20 legal honors that are hired every year and there is an orientation and a graduation subject to appropriations uh, where everybody flies up to DC about six weeks into their first year and they get to meet all of the other legal honors or if you're already in DC you get to meet the folks that are out in the field and um, they take you for a week through all of the things that you need to know um, about being a federal employee, about the Office of General Counsel, about HUD, um, and that's a really nice opportunity to get to meet your peers and you also get to meet the outgoing legal honors who come for graduation. And um, so now you have a built-in network too of people that you can call if you don't want to call your supervisor, you don't want to call your mentor. Hey, can you ask your boss? So I don't have to ask mine. Um, <laughs> So there, there's definitely a lot of camaraderie in OGC, which is really nice. Like I said, we're kind of like a big law firm. Uh, we don't bill time, which is very nice. So um, people are very willing to talk to you. We have an expertise list. I can pick up the phone and call anyone on the list in the country and say, hey, this is Jamie in Jacksonville. I have a question about tax credits, about air rights. Um, and that's a really nice opportunity as well um, to be able to connect with more experienced attorneys that you wouldn't otherwise know um, and they're willing to share their expertise, which is really great. Um, you get challenging work assignments. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, overall, it's a great place to learn how to be a lawyer. Um, you also have, of course, the benefit of being a public servant. You're serving your country, your state, your local community. Um, housing is a very local thing. Um, before I came to HUD, I didn't really realize how important housing is to not just where you live, but how close are you to your job, what kind of job can you get if you don't have a car, are you near public transportation, um, do you have food near your house, do you live in a food desert, what kind of nutrition are your children able to get, what kind of education are your children able to get. And so housing has a lot of impact on other components of our lives that we don't necessarily think about. And um, so it's, even though it's a federal job, it has a very local and statewide impact, which uh, is pretty cool that you're able to serve in so many ways. Um, it's also great work-life balance. I work a 40-hour work week. Um, I am a federal employee, just like any other federal employee. Uh, I have a flexible schedule. I come in between 6 and 9.30. I work my eight hours <coughs> plus a half an hour unpaid lunch, and I go home. Most days I work 8 to 4.30, I go to the gym and I get home by like 6.30. Most of my friends are still at the office, yeah. <laughs> filling time in six minute increments. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good place to work and um, you're able to do very important, very substantive work and work very hard for those eight hours and then you can leave it. Um, I don't have to check my email when I go on vacation. I don't have to check my email if I'm homesick. Um, so those are things that private practice is not going to afford you. Um, federal benefits also with leave, 10 paid holidays. Um, the leave is very good. Um, you get sick leave and paid time off. Uh, the longer you're with the government, the more leave you get. Um, after you start with four hours every pay period, you get paid 26 pay periods a year. So. 13 days sick leave, 13 days of annual leave. After three years, it bumps up to six hours of annual leave per pay period. After 15 years, it bumps up to eight, um, which is why I don't use the government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get a 5% match on your TSP, which I mentioned is like a 401k account. Uh, there is a retirement annuity. If you stay with the federal government long enough and you pay into the system, there will be a uh, pension at the other side. Um, there's mass transit.
transit subsidy is if you ride the bus, you take the metro. Um, in DC, there's also an on-site gym, there's on-site childcare, there's a bike share. Um, those things are available in some regional and field offices as well. Uh, Jacksonville has none of those. I've, I've been pushing for a shower in our building. It's not going to happen. Um, so it's great, right? So what are the criteria to apply? Um, graduating law students. Um, and our selection process is not any one specific thing. It's um, if you look at the brochure, I don't know if you guys have seen this yet, but um, the requirements are very, um, we look for well-rounded folks. It's not any one specific thing that, oh, well, you have really high grades, you're in. Um, it's um, towards the back, you can see that it's a B average or the top 50% of your class or relevant work experience or special training or significant extracurricular activities. Um, our only true requirement is that you be a U.S. citizen. Um, and other than that, it's, it's really a somewhat holistic approach as to, um, you know, do you, do you have an interest in public service? Do you have an interest in what the agency does? Um, do you have academics? Do you have experience? And so all of those things come together um, and we have a rubric on which we score people so that um, everyone's on an even playing field. There's you know, arbitrary and capriciousness. <laughs> um, and so uh, the application materials themselves are the legal honors application form, which uh, y'all have a copy of in front of you. Your resume, which is just a regular legal resume. It's not a federal resume. <coughs> Um, if y'all are all familiar with USA Jobs, there is a federal resume that is very different. It's many pages long. It's got specific dates. It's got chunks and paragraphs. It's very different, and that's not what you need. Um, you do need an official law school transcript, uh, which is another reason we try and get on campus before the week it's due, because it does take time to request an official transcript. Um, if you do not have an official transcript, your application will not be considered. Um, a five to ten page legal writing sample, double spaced, and three professional or academic references. When you go to those references um, for this job or any other, make sure it's going to be a good reference. You laugh, but I have called people and they said, I would not hire that person. Okay. So make sure that when you have that conversation uh, that they're going to give you a good reference. Um, <laughs> And uh, if you are selected for an interview, make sure that you give them a heads up, hey, HUD might be calling you, um, because that is the point at which, depending on how our process is, um, usually there's a score on the interview, and if you achieve a certain score, then your references will be called. Um, so that would be the point at which to give people a heads up. On the transcript, mm -hmm. it has to go with the application, or can it be in process and sent to you all? If it is a paper application, I believe it all has to go together. Mm -hmm. um, if you apply electronically, you can submit all of the things electronically and it can be mailed separately. It does have to be postmarked by September 9th, though. Okay. Um, or if you have the electronic safe script or whatever, I, I don't know about that. I'm apparently now too old for such technology. Um, where they can send a certified electronic copy. Um, that's also acceptable if the school has that capability. Um, and it describes all that in the back of the brochure, um, the details of it. Um, so check the brochure, not what I'm saying. <laughs> I believe I am correct, but if there's anything I've missed, uh, make sure you double check the brochure. Um, cover letters, a lot of students ask about cover letters. You'll see the application does not require that. Um, if you talk to career services, I'm sure they'll tell you never send a resume without a cover letter. Um, we should ask them, our uh, headquarters about this in past years, and the answer they gave is that it does not factor into the squaring of your application, but some attorneys may enjoy reading the letters while completing their reviews. So you can take that as you will. <laughs> Um, and decide whether or not you'd like to send a cover letter. Uh, as with anything, if you're going to send a bad cover letter, send none. Um, if it just says, hi, my name is Jamie, I'd like to work at HUD, I'm really great, don't bother sending that. Um, 
if you've got a great story to tell, um, tell it. You know, you grew up in public housing, you um, have a parent that's a real estate developer, or you did a report on housing in college, whatever. Um, that kind of story, um, you know, tell, tell that kind of thing. And, and I mean, that, that's what any job you apply for. Make sure that your cover letter tells a story, because uh, everybody knows your resume is attached. Um, the application and interviewing process. So everybody applies, they come in by the deadline. Um, anyone that has missed the deadline is automatically excluded. Anyone that doesn't have an official transcript. And then once the applications are all in, they're scored by attorneys as opposed to HR folks. Um, they're scored on a rubric. There is a scoring for um, various things, academics, experience, things like that. Um, a total score is given to each application, and then there's a cutoff, and anyone that's above that cutoff will be called for an interview. The interviews are uh, done usually in October or November of this year, and um, the interviews will be with the local office, so that's not necessarily where you would be placed. Like, even if you wanted to go to D.C. or you wanted to go to San Francisco, um, you would still interview locally with uh, probably either Jacksonville or Miami, possibly with our Atlanta office. Um, usually it's handled directly by Jacksonville or Miami and one of the Atlanta attorneys is on the phone. There's usually two or three interviewers on each interview and the interviews are also on a rubric. Um, there's a scoring for academics, for poise, for interest, experience, um, things like that. And again, there's a cutoff. All of the interviews are scored and if you are above that cutoff, your application is sent from the regional office to headquarters. Headquarters then looks at all of the applications. Perhaps there is another cutoff, and anyone that is above then is uh, going to be part of the first round of offers. So it's a very regimented process. Um, and in that regard, if there are things that you would want to include on your resume that wouldn't necessarily fit on one page, but you think would be important to your application, we're not looking so much at that. If you need to go into two pages to make sure that you get all those points, go into two pages. Um, we care more about the substance of what's on your resume than what it looks like. Um, I remember the first interview that I did, uh, I was you know, two or three years out of law school and somebody had a typo on their resume and I was like, oh, we're throwing it out. Um, because your resume should never, ever have a typo on it because it is the single most important document that you're going to create to sell yourself as a lawyer. Um, and I was interviewing with two older attorneys, you know, 25, 30 years, 35 years of federal government, and they thought I was crazy. They're like, what are, what are you talking about? This is a great candidate. So, um, you know, it depends on your interviewer, but um, the substance is really what matters to most people. Um, the selection and placement. So, say your resume, your application, your interview, get to the top of the pile, your score is at the top, and you're going to get an offer. The offers will come likely in December. Um, and at the time that the offer is made, they'll tell you where the job would be. Um, so you have on that application form in front of you, you can express a preference for practice area, for location. Um, some of them are mutually exclusive, like if you want to do legislation and regulation, you're not going to be doing that in a field office. That's something you do in D.C. because you work with the folks on the Hill. Um, but they do try and honor those preferences. Um, like I said, there's rotations, there's mentorship, there's travel, there's training. Uh, HUD puts a lot of time and money and effort into training the attorneys we bring in through the Legal Honors Program, and we want them to stay with the agency. We want them to understand HUD, to like HUD, to want to serve HUD. And um, at the end of the day, they want the legal honors to be happy with their placement. Sometimes folks are not. And um, if there's an opportunity at the end of your legal year to move you, they will if they can, um, given that, you know, appropriations, performance, bar passage. And um, so when the job offer comes, maybe they say, hey, uh, we would like you to go to San Francisco. And you're like, eh, I don't really want to go to San Francisco. I mean, you can always say no to a job offer, um, or you can go to San Francisco for a year and see what happens. I think anyone can do anything for a year, live anywhere for a year, because a year is not a very long time. Um, 
but that's my personal opinion. Some people have um, obligations that tie them to a certain part of the country, um, to family, to children. Um, but know that your preference is just a preference, and when the offer comes, it may not be where you want to go. Um, my first choice was DC. I wanted to do fair housing. When my offer came, it was to do real estate in Jacksonville. I said, yes, I'll see what happens after a year, and like I said, I just uh, had my seven year. So, um, so things work out. Um, but it, it's something to be cognizant of is that um, you know not everybody is going to be placed in Florida, and it's possible no one would be placed in Florida. Um, but, and I should probably mention this as I'm talking about that, your bar passage just has to be one bar somewhere. So if you pass the bar in Florida and you get licensed here in the sunny of San Francisco, you don't have to take another bar exam. That's it. One, one bar exam for anywhere in the country. As long as you take a bar exam and you pass it. Um, of course, you can maintain your CLEs or whatever in Florida. But um, yeah, so that, that's a nice perk as well, that flexibility to be able to move. Um, so generally, folks are placed um, either in DC or in regional offices, occasionally in field offices if there is a specific need. Um, but generally, one of those 10 regional offices for Washington, DC are the places that they're going to be looking to close legal honors. And um, if you do accept the job offer, like I said, the offers are probably going to come in December, possibly early January. And uh, if you accept, then you're done. You go into your last semester of law school, you have a job, you study for the bar exam, and you start work in September. So it's, 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 it's uh, <laughs> as the possibilities go, it's, it's not a bad one. Um, it's not a bad course to take, it's not a bad place to be, um, you get an opportunity to do a lot of really important work and serve your community and um, there's a lot of exciting opportunities, there's opportunities for upward mobility. Um, someone was just appointed to a associate general counsel position that joined the agency's legal honors in 2008. Um, we've had folks promoted to chief counsel. Um, Jessica was in my class. She was promoted to chief counsel in her office after five years. So um, there, there's a lot of opportunity for um, upward mobility. HUD is a particularly old agency demographically. So um, while we will lose some institutional knowledge, there will be a lot of opportunity for um, new people to come in and uh, reinvigorate the agency and opportunities for them to do work. So. Uh, that's all I've got. Questions? Is this 14 month pay or program paid or is it? It is. Paid? And it's paid pretty well. Okay. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the GS pay system, the GS pay scale. Um, it is the most executive branch agencies are on the GS pay scale, which is the white collar pay scale. Mm -hmm. And it tries to peg it to what someone of a similar uh, experience and job would be doing in that community. So um, you would come in as a GS-11, which when I was hired in 2009 in Jacksonville uh, was 56 and change. I was offered a job at a small private firm for 60, so it's fairly competitive. Um, and you come in on a career ladder. So at the end of that 14 month, if you are converted to an attorney position, you will get a raise to a GS-12, which is approximately $10,000. And then after a year of successful performance, you will get promoted to a 13, which is another $10,000. And then you will be promoted to a 14. The top of the pay scale is a 15. So as a non-supervisory 14, uh, if you talk to government folks and ask them about a non-supervisory 14, they're like, wow, that's a really great job. <laughs> um, and so um, most of the supervisors in ODC are 15s. Um, and the pay scale tops out at about 150. Um, so it, it's it's good money for the work. You're never going to get rich. I mean, it's not law firm partner money. You know, even 20 years out. Um, but you're not going to be poor, and you're going to do work that really matters, and um, you're going to essentially double your salary in four years. Are there any, um, you still have a life. 
And you still have a life. That's right. That's the most right. important way, you <laughs> still have a life. Is there any um, like federal loan payback with? So someone <laughs> always asks about loan forgiveness. And I don't much, but I have some stuff. So there are two different programs. There's the one that everyone hears about, the public service loan forgiveness, 10-year, 120 payment. And that is for anyone that's in a government job, whether it's local, state, federal, uh, 501c3 nonprofits. Um, and that's not just limited to lawyers either. Um, but if you're doing work for an agency with a qualified pay plan, et cetera, et cetera, um, at the end of 120 payments, theoretically you will be eligible to have the rest of your loan forgiven. No one has become eligible for that yet because the first person will not be eligible until October of next year. So right now it's one of those things that seems like a great idea, but I tell students do not bank on it. You're still in school. By the time you graduate, that program may not exist. If you want to go into public service, go into public service because you want to be a public servant. Um, within the federal government, and this is a program just for federal government employees, there is another program which is mentioned in the brochure. Um, the, it, it's essentially a retention program to retain high-level employees. And the federal agencies are allowed to give money to those employees that have expressed that they may leave if they're not given a uh, retention bonus, essentially. And so um, that is supposed to be up to $6,000 a year to a maximum of $40,000. And you're not eligible for it until you've been with the agency for one year. So if you come in as legal honors, you're not entitled to that that first year. But if you are converted to an attorney position, then you would be able to apply. Um, the way that HUD does it, there's a pot of money that's set aside every year. They open an application for one to three weeks, depending on the year. Um, it gets sent out to everyone. You have an opportunity to apply. You say, this is how much money I'm making. This is how much my student loans are. Uh, you send in the documentation. And then if you are um, qualified and you submit the appropriate documentation, the money in the pool is then divvied up based on uh, essentially your ratio of how much you're making to how much you uh, oh, and so um, then you're given some money. They do take taxes off the top, which is about a third. Um, and you sign a service agreement that for your first payment, you'll stay with the government for three years. So if they give you money that first year, you sign a service agreement that you'll stay for three, and you hope that the next two years they also have a loan forgiveness program. Um, you're not necessarily entitled to money those next two years. Um, one of the years, they did not have our program at HUD because we could have gotten furloughed. Uh, so instead of furloughing all of the staff, they got rid of the loan forgiveness program for that one year. Um, although I've received about $15,000 towards my loan over the last seven years, um, given that there were a year I wasn't eligible and there was a year they didn't do it. So it's not a huge sum of money, but it's not insignificant. Um, and if you leave during that service agreement, you have to pay that money back, including the taxes that you had to pay on it. So if they give you $2,000, but you only see $1,500 get your loan balance, if you leave, you're paying back the $2,000. Um, but if you're intending to stay anyway, it's um, a nice uh, uh, opportunity to um, decrease your loan balance. And, and, you know, because, I mean, you reach a point where you start thinking, like, okay, I'm three years in, I'm four years in, I'm in that lateral sweet spot. If somebody paid me just $20,000 more a year, I could just pay off my loans and leave, you know? And so as you start to think about those kind of things, and they're like, well, here, we'll, we'll make a couple of payments for you. You're like, no. Well, all right, the calculus becomes a little different, um, which is why it really is a retention issue, because especially for uh, upper-level white-collar employees, often there is much more money in the private sector. So. Anything else? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Um, tell your fellow classmates, Jamie will be in the atrium and ALC doing an info table for a while so they can come by and meet her and ask any questions. So we do appreciate it, and thank you very much. <laughs>